Body fluids are constantly filtered and replaced as fluid balance is maintained through intake and output. The total amount of water within each fluid space is stable, but individual water molecules move continually among all spaces. As a result, water in all spaces is exchanged continuously while maintaining constant fluid volume. All patients are at risk for some degree of fluid imbalance because many health problems can disrupt fluid intake or output. Fluid imbalances can occur in any setting. In dehydration, fluid intake or fluid retention is less than what is needed to meet the body's fluids needs, resulting in a fluid volume deficit, especially a plasma volume deficit. It is a condition rather than a disease and can be caused by many factors that are listed in Table 13-3 on page 173 of your textbook. Review this table. Dehydration may be an actual decrease in total body water caused by either too little intake of fluid or too great of a loss of fluid. It can also occur without an actual loss of total body water, such as when water shifts from the plasma into the interstitial space. This condition is called relative dehydration. There are different forms of dehydration. Most common being isotonic, the process of water and electrolyte loss. Common causes stem from fluid intake is less than fluid loss. This can be easily corrected by increasing fluid intake. Table 13-3, page 173 of your textbook, provides common causes of dehydration. Review this table. Older clients are at risk for moderate or severe dehydration due to the inability to get their own drinks or they may attempt to decrease intake due to that they don't want to urinate frequently. Their thought is if they take in less liquids then they will not have to void as often. Encouragement is needed to promote adequate fluid intake and this is done through education and hydration programs. Okay, so let's recap. Who is at risk for dehydration? Those at risk are those that live in dry climates and higher altitudes due to fluid loss through the respiratory tract. Teach individuals who live in dry climates or higher altitudes to increase their fluid intake and avoid fluids that increase fluid loss such as alcohol or beverages containing caffeine. Remember, the aging population may be unable to obtain their own fluids. Be sure to offer fluids often. This inability generally is linked to either a cognitive or a motor dysfunction. During the assessment process, a general history is needed. One way of organizing the history data is to assess the patient's fluid status and use Gordon's functional health patterns. Remember, one liter of water weighs 2.2 pounds. You will assess the patient for any changes in fluid intake and output. Question if they have been taking a diuretic or a laxative. Inquire if they need assistance with their needs and ask questions in regards to their sense of thirst. Some clinical manifestations include in the cardiovascular you may see an increase in heart rate but a decrease in blood pressure and pulse pressure. Orthostatic hypotension may be present. The respiratory changes include an increase in rate but a decrease in blood volume reducing perfusion and oxygenation. During assessment of the skin and mucous membrane, you will note color, moisture, and turgor. Skin turgor in older adults should be assessed over the sternum or on the forehead because as a person ages, the skin loses elasticity and tints on the hands and arms even when the aging patient is well hydrated. Neurologically, blood flow in the brain is reduced, leading to mental status changes and body temperature change. Generally, a low-grade fever will be noted. The fever then potentiates the increase of more fluid loss. Renal changes in dehydration affect urine volume and composition. Urine may become concentrated with a greater specific gravity. It may be dark in color and display a strong odor. Weight loss over a half pound per day is considered a fluid loss. 
No single lab test result confirms or rules out dehydration. Dehydration is determined by laboratory findings along with clinical manifestations. Laboratory findings with dehydration are consistent with increased levels of hemoglobin, hematocrit, serum osmolarity, glucose, protein, blood urea nitrogen, and various electrolytes because more water is lost and other substances remain. This increases the osmolarity or concentration of the blood hemoconcentration. Hemoconcentration is not present when dehydration is caused by hemorrhage because loss of all blood and plasma products occur together. When it comes to collaborative care, potential nursing diagnoses are deficient fluid volume, decreased cardiac output, impaired oral mucous membranes, confusion, risk for falls, risk for impaired skin integrity, potential for dysrhythmias, and potential for electrolyte imbalances. The primary goals are to prevent injury, prevent further fluid loss, and to increase fluid compartment volumes. This can be accomplished through fluid replacement. Now we are going to discuss fluid overload or also referred to as overhydration. Fluid overload is an excess of body fluid. It is not a disease but rather a clinical sign that fluid intake or retention is greater than the body's fluid needs. This is done by either actual excess or relative excess. Most common fluid overload is caused by excess fluid in the vascular space or dilution of specific electrolytes and blood components. It can also be in the result of severe overload or poor cardiac function. As nurses we will identify the overload either due to isotonic, hypotonic, or hypertonic. Again, during the assessment phase, Gordon's functional health pattern is a great tool for guidance during an assessment. Questions you may ask are, does your ring feel tighter? Have you recently gained weight? How much salt do you use? Ask about voiding frequency and amount. Observe for any noted edema. Clinical manifestations are listed in chart 13-6, page 179 of your textbook. Review the chart. I will discuss a few of these. Cardiovascular, the patient's pulse will be bounding and increased, blood pressure increased, and possible distended neck and hand veins. In the respiratory, the patient will demonstrate shallow respirations with an increase in rate and potentially exhibit crackles in the lungs during oscillation. Skin and mucous membranes will appear edematous, pale and cool to the touch. Neuromuscular signs and symptoms can include headache, visual disturbances, and altered consciousness. Gastrointestinal changes include increased motility and possibly an enlarged liver. Diagnostically, serum electrolyte values are generally normal, but may have a decreased hemoglobin hematocrit and serum protein levels may result from excessive water in the vascular space known as hemodilution. Generally people think drinking excessive water is not dangerous. I encourage you to watch the YouTube video that is provided after this lesson so you can understand the dangers of flood overload. During collaborative care, potential nursing diagnoses are excess fluid volume, deficient knowledge, potential for electrolyte imbalances, potential for hypertension, and potential for pulmonary edema. Overall goals and outcomes are to ensure patient safety, 
Restore normal flood balance through drug therapy to remove excess flood and to prevent future flood overload and this can be done through nutrition therapy and flood restrictions. Remember we can monitor for flood dehydration and flood excess through accurate intake and output recording and weight gain or loss. This concludes the lesson of flood imbalances. If you have any questions related to this content, contact the instructor.